With more and more content and characters making its mark in the list of things to do and to build in Star Rail, I think it's time for us to take a deeper look at how you can properly navigate your path onto one of the most important parts of any video game journey, which is the endgame. And for this particular video, we're gonna look at how it is that the characters you pull can better help you clear them more comfortably. Like always, these are tips and tricks as well as habits that, in my opinion, have helped me manage my trek through Star Rail's abundant endgame and character management, all of which also helped me avoid stressing out and burning my soul out to cinders on this game. And I'm here to share all of those neat little things with you guys. So without further ado, let's delve into Star Rail's Art of the Endgame, or as Doctor Strange would say, We're in the endgame now. And as always, the name's Leafy, and welcome back to Casual Guides to Games, Star Rail Edition. From my experience, Star Rail's endgame really boils down to your understanding between two facets of the game and how you, as a certain type of player, would want to work around effectively balancing those two things. Those two things being, one, understanding what every type of Star Rail endgame content aims to test you in, and number two, knowing what you have, need, or want to do in order to go through those content while eliminating as much unnecessary difficulty as possible. In a way, you have to determine how to balance prioritizing your preferences with doing the things that you need to do to progress smoothly. Which is why I want to split the video into mainly talking about these two things and how it is that they will always intertwine with one another the more you try to find your routine and goals during the endgame. And just because she really fits the theme of the video and she coincidentally has the kit to better emphasize the endgame differences, I'm gonna use Fei Xiao later on to further explain how you can better identify where different playstyles might be a better fit for certain parts of the endgame. So, let's start with the first half of the video and discuss how you can identify the different types of endgames in Star Rail and what part of the overall game mechanics itself that those sections are actually trying to test you in. For those of you who feel like you already have a good grasp on all the endgame sections, feel free to skip ahead to the part that dives into maximizing your account to your preferences while also maintaining a good balance of endgame need to do's. Alright, let's get this started. At the moment of writing, Star Rail revolves around five different main branches of endgame. Number one is Memory of Chaos, number two, Simulated Universe, number three, Pure Fiction, and number four, the newly added Divergent Universe and the newly added Apocalyptic Shadow. All five of these sections are a mix of testing the bounds of your team building skills and also challenging your mastery of how every one of your characters work. And you can incorporate their unique skills in different matters of scenarios. And I think it's really important for people to actually understand what these endgames actually is trying to test you on. Because I've seen a lot of people who are frustrated at their inability to clear these contents, only to see that they've been going about it in the completely wrong way. The first two game modes are the ones that really test you in a more general capacity. The first one being Memory of Chaos. This game mode is the most straightforward endgame Star Rail currently has. It tests the depth of your overall squad and it challenges the raw power and versatility of each of your characters, since you will need separate teams whilst also testing your knowledge of the enemy itself. Sometimes you get rotational buffs that are usually meant to promote newly released characters, but the buffs are usually pretty universal and can be taken advantage of by a wide array of teams. The next endgame segment of this category is the simulated universe, and it is where you probably start thinking a bit more. The simulated universe tests your understanding of each of the paths currently in the game, looking at your ability to use their path resonances and path blessings, which are designated buffs to help your team beat shit up as you traverse through the simulated domains that feature realms and occurrences that can either help you or screw you over. They even go so far as to test paths that do not exist as playable ones in the game, such as Propagation and Elation. So it's really up to you to find which characters or teams that can best use these buffs. Sometimes it's rather straightforward. Hunt characters fit more to the hunt path, preservation characters can use preservation path to amp damage through shielding and yada yada yada, but there are some playstyles that are not so simple. Akron, a nihility character, plays best when you play her with the path of erudition because of how much you play around her ultimate and erudition is the king of buffing that aspect of the game. Your ability to find these quirks are further tested in their two expansion modules, the first of which is Golden Gears. This is where you use those same paths 
Only this time, you roll dices as your means of exploration, and you can customize them based on different playstyles. They also introduce you to mashing effects from two types of paths and giving you a buff that benefits both paths, which are called Resonance Interplays. The second expansion module is called the Swarm Disaster. In principle, it's basically the same as Golden Gears, only this time, you have more occurrences and dices to play with, and your main enemy is the embodiment of beetles from hell, and they will either dick you down to death or debuff you to death. So, pick your poison. And now, we go into the game modes that test your ability to adapt to more specific niches in the games, the first of which is Pure Fiction. In every Pure Fiction rotation, it will have a specific big boy damage dealing buff that you need to trigger through specific playstyles in order to get through getting the highest score. It started as a way to promote follow-up attack squads cause they weren't exactly doing well in the beginning, but it has evolved to also testing ultimate-centric teams and nihility or DOT teams. Essentially, it curtails you into playing a certain DPS mechanism, and if you think it sucks when you don't have the team for the specific buffs, well, tough luck. You're in the endgame, gotta get that team def going. The next game mode is the Divergent Universe. We can honestly just refer to this as simulated universe on steroids because even though you no longer use those path resonances directly, the blessings you get are stronger and that resonance interplay from Golden Gears are now called equations, where you have to get certain amount of two different path blessings to activate these insanely powerful buffs. Generally, this game mode favors Destruction's new DPS mechanic called Super Break, which focuses on breaking your enemies and dealing damage while they are down and broken. Just like what your typical Asian mom would do to their child who got an A- in maths. Oh, and it also favors a lot of follow-up attack teams as well. But other playstyles such as DOT and Hunt DPS are still very usable, just not with the same nuke abilities as those initial two have. And the last one from these endgame sections is called the Apocalyptic Shadow. Now this one favors the shit out of the new Super Break DPS mechanic. All of your enemies' buffs revolves around having numbers on their side and maintaining their shield's toughness, and all of their debuffs revolve around breaking them. And when I say your enemy has a lot of buffs, they have quite a number of them, and they're all pretty much essays to read through as well, so this one really tests on your ability to know what to do to put your opponents in a disadvantage. Now, one pattern that you've probably have noticed to have cropped up very often in all of these endgame sections is that it really tests how much versatility you have within your roster of built characters. You need to have an understanding of multiple paths for a lot of them, and you definitely need several different playstyles readily built if you want to be able to clear them comfortably. And just to be clear here, when I say comfortably, I don't mean being able to get full baller max points from these stages, like I'm not telling you to do 80,000 clears in pure fiction here. I just want you to be able to do enough to get all the rewards. In any case, I want you to understand that testing your versatility is exactly what Star Rail's endgame is all about. Because in testing that, it is not only testing your overall knowledge of how every mechanic in the game works, but it also tests your ability to properly prepare, parse your fuel and resources in the game, and your ability to maximize your goals and routines in the game itself. Which leads us to part 2 of the video, where you have to be able to understand and know what it is that you actually want to do have to do, and need to do in order to be able to effectively use your knowledge of the game and also your time in the game. Because at the end of the day, even if you full will on the game, the amount of resources you are able to farm per day is limited by the time constraint fuel. So you really need to be able to understand how you want to shape your usage of that fuel, make it so that you don't waste it on things that you might regret spending it on later down the line. You can first do this by establishing what type of player you are and how it is that you will be spending your premium currency when you pull for certain characters. Are you a player who follows the meta closely and want nothing but top performance from your characters? Are you someone who pulls depending on how much you like them as a character in the story? Or maybe you're a pure waifu or hus bundle puller? Whatever type you are, you have to understand that the characters you pull will fall into certain types of playstyles, and you will have to take note of said characters' advantages and limitations particularly in regards to the multiple types of endgame segments that Star Rail has. Now this is where we can finally take a look at Fei Xiao and use her as a baseline for our thought process here. Let's input her into the questions that I've laid out beforehand and answer them afterwards. First up is what do you want to do, which is get Fei Xiao and use her in endgame teams. The second one is what do you have to do, 
in which case you have to understand her kit and find the best or most comfortable team for you to maximize or use her kit to a certain degree of effectiveness. And the third is, what do you need to do? To which the answer would be, farm her talent and ascension materials and consider the relic sets that you need for her. When you've made up your mind about pulling for someone for the sake of actually putting them in your roster of usable characters, these questions can usually help you figure out what sort of role it is that you want your new character to fill in regards to your squad's overall endgame versatility. And you might be asking, but why should I find the most comfortable team for me to play instead of finding the best one? Well, sometimes playing something that is outside your comfort zone can be unsettling. And in my opinion, if you can find a team that can counterbalance that lack of comfortability with some familiarity, and you can still clear content with that team, then I'd always suggest going with something you can relax and have a bit more fun with. In regards to Fei Xiao, your considerations are pretty straightforward. She has insane single target damage and the fact that her ultimate ignores toughness types and also counts as follow-up damage means that she has a whole slew of buffs that she can take advantage of from all the different type of endgame section buffs. However, she has zero AoE damage, which will hinder you from clearing content that counts their cycles through cleared waves. This is where your comfortability can start kicking in. I was suggested to use Faisal alongside Topaz, who is, of course, the queen of follow-up attack sub DPS, but that's just too much single target for me, so I pair her up with Yun Li, who is also a great partner for Faisal, and therefore quelling my AoE worries. From the outset of her advantages alone, we can immediately begin implementing it to our knowledge of what the multiple facets of Star Rail's endgame aims to test. In memory of Chaos, you can run her comfortably with most hyper carry or crit based DPS comps. Though optimally, since you want to have her trigger as much attacks as possible, you'd want to partner her up with another follow up attack to get more hits in and build up to your ultimate much faster. The dilemma, however, doesn't normally fixate on the part where you determine which characters to play with your Fei Xiao, but it's more about thinking on who you can put in her team while not compromising on your choices for the other teams. This is how the MOC actually tests you, to see if you have enough characters to rotate around in order to have squads that can properly beat up certain combinations of enemies. Sometimes, all is well and you can comfortably play two different teams on both hops, but sometimes, they either pit you with enemies that have the same weakness types when you only have one DPS capable of fighting that type, or each side of the halves have a certain mechanic that you only have one character of to deal with, and you have to sit there for a bit and think about your life choices. Welcome to the endgame, my friends. For both Simulated Universe and Divergent Universe, Fei Xiao's flexibility and versatility shines even further. Like I said, while she is an ultimate-centric hunt character, follow-up attack is such a big part of her kit. And with her ultimate hits being considered follow-up attack, that's even more blessings and paths that she can take advantage of. You can go full elation and just buff up her follow-up attack to the sky. You can also take advantage of the ultimate damage boost and brain in the vat effects of erudition, which can give you multiple instances of free ults because remember, if brain in the vat activates, then you'll get to ult with her for another two times. And of course, hunt blessings will always be a welcome addition to the collection of buffs you would want to use her with. Now, pure fiction is where you might start to see some of her limitations come through because while yes, she will be very usable when the buff trigger is to use ultimates or follow up attacks, but she will be jack useless when the nihility rotation decided to finally rear its ugly head. And then we go on to apocalyptic shadow to see all that disadvantage go away seeing as the fact that her ultimate ignores weakness and reduces toughness regardless of who she is facing then she will probably be a popular choice in a team that doesn't use Boot Hill or Firefly since she can easily trigger all those weakness break debuffs that Apocalyptic Shadow is all about. And then you get your action forwarded again as you break them and then you get all your ultimates back and you can do more ults with Fei Xiao. Well, you get my point. You're gonna be doing a lot of ultimates with this girl boss Foxy in general. In any case, this is the sort of character investigation that you're gonna have to do or, you know, might wanna do if you wanna fully figure out how it is that said character can contribute to your endgame endeavors. You can apply these rounds of questioning to every single character that you have. All you need to do is to adjust it based on the type of character they are because you're never gonna quite get the same type of versatility that you might see from what I've displayed face out to be capable of. Let's say you looking at Robin who's a follow-up attack support, then you know exactly which teams and game modes would probably need her services more. 
you're looking at Japard. Just built insane defense on him and get some good ER and he can pretty much tank through most content. Though, you might want to opt for sustains that have cleansing abilities like Locha and Lynx if you are going up against debuff applying donkeys. Remember to always look at the content situation and check whether or not your team have the necessary mechanics to counteract said content special characteristics. And you always have to view this both on the sustain side and the damage dealing side. Whether you need a shield or more healing cleanse on the defense side, and whether or not you need to focus on specific DPS mechanics for that particular endgame segment. And that's about it for this segment of the Art of Star Rails endgame. I will be making another one which falls in line with this whole subsection of my casual guides that will focus more on the general tips and tricks that I have in terms of tackling the prep for endgame on a daily basis. Hope you found this video to be helpful or at least you were able to take something away from it. If you did, then feel free to leave a like and also feel free to leave your thoughts on the comments down below. Until the next video, the name's Leafy, and I'll see you all next time. Sayonara.